And good evening. Thank you for your invitation and for your warm welcome. And special thanks to Ram Team, who has been patiently waiting uh, almost like a year <laughs> that to get me here. And uh, I really am honored to be invited here. Well, uh, we have all heard speakers begin by saying, I'm happy to be here, no matter where they are. And I suppose some of them actually mean it. But I must say that being here in a university environment, in such a beautiful uh, campus, is very comfortable for me. It takes me back to some of the most pleasant times in my life. I'm reminded of the day in 1974, long before you guys are born, when I arrived on the campus of a Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University in Chicago to begin my graduate uh, studies. As to Northwestern, by the way, considering the difference in winter weather between North, Northern Illinois and Southern California, I'd say those of you who opted for Loyola, Loyola Marymount made a wide choice. <laughs> 1974 was a very important year for Toyota and for me. It marked the beginning of the company's accelerated globalization. Although we have been exporting vehicles for many years, we stepped up our pace and entered many other new regions. Toyota management knew there would be a need to transfer talents overseas to support the company's international growth. And I was among the group of people chosen to help lead those efforts. The first step was getting my MBA in the United States. That's what put me on a university campus 38 years ago. And the work I have done since then is what brings me here today. But before I get too far ahead of myself, let me back up a bit and explain the genesis of Toyota's globalization and localization, which is called local by some of our people. Toyota Motor Corporation is once again the world's largest automaker with a quarter million employees and a quarter trillion dollars in annual sales. This year we will build nearly nine million cars and trucks in 26 countries and sell them in 170 countries and regions around the world. Because you know Toyota as an automaker, I should explain that the company didn't start that way. Toyota began as a builder of looms for the textile industry. Our founder created some innovations and eventually patents of automatic looms that he was able to sell to one British company. The money he earned made it possible for his son to realize his vision to build an uh, automobile company. Beginning in 1937, Toyota Motor grew rapidly in Japan and in the 50s began to spread into the markets of the Middle East, Europe, North America, and other areas around the globe. In each market, Toyota's business began with sales of products imported from Japan, and mainly land cruisers. Much later, the company began opening plants in many of those key markets. Local manufacturing benefited in a number of ways by being a part of a global operation. One was their freedom to produce and sell vehicles in the local currency, less dependent on an exchange rate. Another was the economic economies of scale that meant a local operation had access to products and parts with massive global volume. In the United States, for example, two of today's biggest volume seller are two of the largest volume models in the world, Camry and Corolla. This has benefited in distribution, pricing, parts, and cost, resulting in greater profits 
at the local level. A third benefit is the investment by the parent company in facilities and equipment for the local operation. Again, using our American com uh, companies as an example, the investment that began here in 1957 today amount to over $18 billion. These investments have far-reaching effects on the local economy, where business of many kinds help to build and expand the production infrastructure. Today, on a global basis, we are investing more than one million per hour in these capital investments, investments that are spread to many places around the world. Incidentally, we are also investing more than one million dollars per hour in research and development, with a large share of that work taking place in diverse local operations. The rapid expansion of overseas sales and especially of overseas production required a large and growing flow of the management talent from the headquarters to those overseas operations. When they include me, first I was rather shocked. Then I was proud I could help build our business. Just after the turn of the current century, our chairman back then declared that Toyota was changing from an international company with the operation, operations guided by the centralized management team into a truly global enterprise with operations guided by a common corporate culture. That culture has its foundation in a set of principles known as the Toyota way. Created bit, uh, bit by bit over the uh, company's first seven, 70 decades, the Toyota way has existed in written form only since 2001. Until it was written down a dozen years ago, it had been simply passed along from one associate to another and one generation to another by word and by example. There are two sturdy pillars in the Toyota way. Continuous improvement and respect for people. They have guided the ways Toyota people work and interact with others for a very long time. Continuous improvement simply means that there is no best, only better. We aim to do better each day than the day before. Improve everything we touch and humbly accept that our work, best work is still not perfect. Respectful people means mutual trust and mutual responsibility between the company and its workers. Equality of opportunities, open and sincere communication, the acceptance of differences, accountability, and perhaps above all, fairness. Respect for people embodies the concept of always placing the interests of others ahead of our own. I'd have to say that having respect for people as one of the company's founding principles gives Toyota a special advantage in dealing with today's complex global society. As we added to a growing global network of executives, more and more of the new people appointed were local talents, not imported from Japan. So the makeup of the population of Toyota managers around the world underwent a great change. And with it came new customs, new beliefs, new ways of thinking and new ways of doing business. And in each place, these local managers related better to their workforce and better understood their nation's customers. This is an example of an organization thinking globally, acting locally. Over time, many local na nationals rose to executive positions and some became the presidents of overseas companies. Among others, 
Those include Mexico, France, Italy, and the United Kingdom, as well as the United States, where Jim Lentz is a president. With the changes in management and method put in place since the election of Akio Toyota as a global president, a substantial degree of autonomy is in the hands of local executives. That's a big change for a Japanese company with a long tradition of centralized leadership. Another big change occurred when Toyota Motor Corporation began turning over responsibility for local product engineering and design to our people in these local markets. This meant that local talent would be engaged not only in the building and selling of Toyota vehicles, but in the original creation of them as well. In Europe, a Toyota Design Center has been given authority for a number of vehicles, including, for example, leadership in the worldwide development of our Yaris subcompact for all markets. In the United States this month, we have just launched production of our all new Avalon. The first vehicles who design, engineering, manufacturing, and testing was carried out entirely by Americans. Akio Toyota is a complete car guy who approves every new design, and he usually has something to add, or changes to suggest, or even de declines. But when he saw the prototype of the US designed Avalon, he just said, that's cool, don't change a thing. <laughs> Across the globe, Toyota spurs the development of international trade between its local companies. Each of our companies that produces finished products imports assemblies and parts and materials from countries that also are markets for their cars and trucks it helps to produce. This is beneficial for places where societies are trying to build their middle class, again, thinking globally and acting locally. For example, Poland and Czech Re Republic import vehicles from France, and both countries export to France the engines and transmissions that power the vehicles they import. There is a robust flow of export from Brazil to Argentina and vice versa, where NIDA operations makes all the parts for all its vehicles. And in Asia, components made in Indonesia and Malaysia are exported to Thailand, which in turn export finished vehicles to these uh, source countries. Other multinational and multi-regional networks like this are at work in other parts of the world, between UK, Europe, New Zealand, and Japan, between Turkey and the markets of Europe, and between South Africa and Europe, Indonesia, and Thailand. In every place that we build vehicles to satisfy local demand and also promote global export business, we believe we are helping to advance the progress of our host countries. This is especially true in less developed regions. By the way, Toyota's North American operations are also exporters, including perhaps oddly, some products sent to Japan. And last month, we began export of the Kentucky build Venza crossover to South Korea. In addition to Venza's, our American operations export Indiana assembled Siena minivan, Highlander, and Sequoia SUVs. The Kentucky assembled Camry and Avalon, and the Texas produced Tacoma and Tundra pickup trucks as well. We currently export US assembled vehicles to 21 countries around the world. Vast networks of suppliers surround the production facilities providing the tens of thousands of assemblies, parts, and materials needed for each vehicle. Today, that's actually up to around 30,000 parts per car. Here in North America, Toyota partners with more than 500 suppliers 
and purchases $25 billion annually in parts, materials, and components. Local sources also provide our plants with packing materials, transportation, power, and other utility, utilities, food services, communications, and numerous other services. The growth of these local companies provides another boost to the progress of developing countries and the growth of global middle class. It is estimated that every worker in one of the Toyota plants is supported by five workers in our supplier community. So it is likely that well over a million people worldwide work on the production of Toyota vehicles directly or indirectly. Of course, local companies also spring up to bring Toyota's products to market. Today, Toyota is represented by more than 14,000 auto dealers worldwide, most of them independently owned local businesses. These entrepreneurs are the retail outlets for a company's products, and each of them knows the territory. They are in daily contact with, media, with our millions of vehicles owners and with millions of more consumers. That's why expand, we expand a great amount of effort to help train dealers, automotive technicians, as well as their teams engaged in sales and marketing, finance and accounting, and business management. Our company's global knowledge center, headquartered in here in Southern California, manages the exchange of information between our global sales and marketing affiliates, bringing global best practices to local dealers in every corner of our worldwide organizations. The host, host communities that provide both our workers and our customers receive substantial support from Toyota. Our people participate in every kind of community activities and our philanthropy helps to improve the lives of local citizens. In the United States, for example, over the past decades, we have contributed more than a half billion dollars to charitable organizations. We have also shared our Toyota production system expertise to help schools, hospitals, and nonprofit improve their operations to increase their impact. For instance, after the Hurricane Katrina, with Toyota's help, the St. Bernard Project, one of the primary housing recovery organizations, was able to reduce the amount of time to build a new home by more than 50%. Our production system also helps reduce the lines of food banks across the country, in one case from one hour to just 18 minutes. Another program I'm very proud of is Toyota 100 Cars for Good. For this program, Toyota gave away 100 cars in 100 days to nonprofit charitable organizations with the help of Facebook voters. 500 nonprofits were selected as finalists, and the public voted each day of their favorite organization. This program was a huge win for these nonprofits, and the vehicles are being use, used to extend their reach to local communities all across the country. Well, I'm very proud of the part of my company plays in elevating standards of living in many parts of the world, helping to grow the great middle class in our local host communities. I am proud of improving people's mobility as well as raising their chances to earn better living. Certainly, this is what Toyota's founder had in mind more than 75 years ago when he expressed the company's commitment to the world around it. He said, Toyota's mission is to enrich society through building cars. Over the past decades, some 
in the automotive press have been busy calculating which competitor is the largest auto company. They do not understand that being the biggest auto maker is not our objective or our plan, not the kind of company we want to be. We aim not for global leadership, but for local leadership. As our people say it, we want to be the most successful and respected car company in each of our markets. To be successful, we must build leading products to the highest standards of quality, durability, and reliability. And to be respected, we must earn a solid reputation for good corporate citizenship, providing for our host communities, helping to secure their progress and helping to realize their hopes and aspirations. And that circle back to respect for people. Thank you very much.